Hello everyone! For the past few months, I've been wondering, what would it look like if you applied a sorting algorithm to a video game? When you think of computer images, you probably think of them like photographs, which are pretty much immutable. This perception makes it difficult to visualize how traditional programming problems would be applied to images. But if we instead shift our perspective and think of images as just a bunch of numbers, then it becomes much easier to understand how we can apply common algorithms to image data. The technique of applying a sorting algorithm to an image is usually referred to as pixel sorting. This concept isn't new, but it's very niche and doesn't have any academic research to reference because it has no legitimate use case. In fact, it's so niche that no one can say for certain when or where the technique was first used, and as far as I'm aware, an efficient real-time pixel sorting shader for games doesn't currently exist. Before we can sort pixels though, we need to learn a sorting algorithm. Sorting data is often the first non-trivial problem that beginner programmers are presented with. It involves taking data and rearranging it such that it's in sorted order. What initially seems like a simple task quickly turns into an endlessly deep rabbit hole of sorting algorithm research that some programmers never return from. Sorting algorithms date back to 1951, with Betty Holberton authoring some of the first documents on the topic. Look, chat. This is my problem with this guy's videos. Like, he wastes so much time on history that no one cares about. Just get to the point already. Show us the pixel sorter. Whatever, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Since we want to make a real-time pixel sorting shader, we need to research GPU sorting algorithms. Unfortunately, this already puts us off to a bad start. GPUs are very, very fast, but this doesn't mean they're fast at everything. Most sorting algorithms involve shifting lots of memory around, as well as requiring complex decision-making. Two things GPUs are really bad at. Conversely, CPUs are great at these. In other words, GPUs are stupid faster, while CPUs are smarter slower. This leads us to the world's dumbest, yet fastest GPU sorting algorithm, the Parallel Bitonic Merge Sort. What makes it so dumb? Well, while a CPU sorting algorithm might make many different informed decisions to reduce its overall workload, the Parallel Bitonic Merge Sort does the exact same amount of work every time, no matter what, perfect for our GPU that can't think for itself. Consider the following set of 16 numbers. To Parallel Bitonic Merge Sort this array, we dispatch threads equal to half the number of elements we want to sort. Then, we follow this very simple looking set of instructions. Each vertical line is an index of the array, and each horizontal line is an individual thread comparing two numbers and swapping them if needed. For example, the first step involves each thread comparing neighboring indices. If the number in the greater index is less than the number in the lesser index, we swap the numbers. In the end, these steps will always result in a sorted array and the pattern of the parallel bitonic merge sort instructions expand to sort any array as long as its length is a power of 2. But Acerola, we want to sort an image, not a random array of 16 numbers. Well, since colors are made up of 3 numbers, a red, green, and blue value, we need to reduce that to a single value for our sorting algorithm. This means we could sort by one of the 3 values, or we can use the color information to calculate a new value like luminance, hue, or saturation. Then, we interpret each column of our image as an array of numbers and execute our sorting algorithm. The result is, obviously, an image with sorted pixels. The parallel bitonic merge sort takes around 2 milliseconds to sort a 1024 by 1024 image on my 1660, which isn't great, but it's pretty good for GPU sorting. I'm sure you've noticed though that this doesn't look very good as a visual effect. It has novelty, but it turns our image into an unintelligible mush of pixels, and all form is lost. So what are existing pixel sorters doing to fix this? The most popular use of pixel sorting is credited to generative artist Kim Assendorf, which they implemented in processing as a CPU algorithm. Kim's pixel sort works like so. Apply a contrast mask, and then sort the contiguous parts of the mask. 
This sounds very simple, so all we have to do is convert this to a shader effect to apply to video games. To make a contrast mask, we declare two thresholds, a low threshold and a high threshold. If the luminance of our pixel is within the range of our two thresholds, we color it white, otherwise we color it black. The mask makes it so pixels that are too bright or too dark are left alone, and everything in between will get sorted. This way, the image maintains some sense of form. Now we have to do the sorting. I'll be referring to these uninterrupted lines of white pixels in the mask that need to be sorted as spans. Ideally, we would dispatch a parallel bitonic merge sort for each span in the mask, but unfortunately, we can't do that. It's the CPU's job to tell the GPU what to do and how much to do it, but since the contrast mask lives on the GPU, the CPU has no idea how many spans are in a given row of pixels nor does it know where those spans begin and end. We could technically ask the GPU to give the mask to the CPU, but transferring data between the two can take upwards of 40 milliseconds, which would instantly disqualify our effect from being real time. In fact, every graphics programmer's brain is trained, such that the moment you think about reading data back from the GPU, this sound plays. <laughs> Since we can't make use of our parallel sorting algorithm, we're gonna have to do something that will probably get me fired from my job. After a long period of brainstorming, this solution is coming straight from my brain. The first plan of action is to figure out where the spans start and end. We dispatch one thread for each column of the mask. Each thread will walk along the mask until it finds its first white pixel. Then, it takes note of the pixel's position. The thread will keep walking along the column, incrementing a counter until it finds a black pixel. We then store the length of the span in the position of the first pixel in the output buffer, and continue on until we find another white pixel. Since the length of the span is stored in the pixel it starts at, we can easily deduce the start and end points of each span, with minimal memory costs. But what if I told you that this texture is actually a second mask? Since the CPU can't determine how much work needs to be done, this texture will control that for us. We dispatch one thread for every pixel of the image, and whichever thread happens to line up with a pixel in the span length texture will be responsible for sorting that entire span, effectively acting like a mask for our dispatched threads. We can easily visualize this by converting our thread ID into a color. The thread will iterate through each pixel of the span that it matched up with, filling in each pixel with its unique color along the way. This is the graphics programming equivalent of throwing a massive mound of shit at the wall, and whatever sticks has to do a lot of work. Work, which also sounds like a metaphor for being born. I'm sure this all sounds really bad so far, but don't worry, it's about to get worse. Instead of coloring in the span, we want the thread to sort the pixels. Yeah, this means we're doing single threaded sorting on the GPU. I expect to be laid off shortly after releasing this video. I ended up writing my own sorting algorithm for this, which works like so. The thread is going to iterate over the pixels and find the index of the minimum luminance value. We store that pixel at the first of available slot in the sorted buffer, and we replace the original value with an arbitrarily high number so that it never gets picked again. We repeat this process for every element in the span until we have a sorted output buffer. If everything goes right, we should have a working pixel sorter shader. How exciting! But let's look at the performance. Call the fire department. We just nuked the building. Yeah. This is pretty bad, and it gets even worse. For reference, performance targets for post-processing effects are generally 2 milliseconds max, and that's for 1080p, while our render is 800 by 800. Our render currently has a decent amount of work being divided up on the GPU, which is good, and that's what we want. But consider the case of a completely white mask. Spans will be the same length as the image, meaning one thread per row will be responsible for sorting the entire image. Legalize nuclear bombs. Obviously, this isn't even close to fast enough for games, so we're going to have to optimize. I'm now going to explain the process of basic shader optimization. To make this more bearable to the average viewer, please enjoy these clips of my cat. Shader performance problems can be categorized as one of two kinds of bottlenecks. GPUs have limited memory, and if your shader is going to cost more memory than you have budget for, then the game is over and you can't render anything in real time anymore. Our pixel sorter is using one 8-bit buffer, one 16-bit buffer, one 32-bit buffer, and lastly, the 64-bit source buffer provided by Unity. This isn't that much memory at all, so clearly 
clearly our bottleneck is elsewhere. Shader code is often what we think of first to optimize as programmers, but our pixel sorting algorithm is already about as good as it can get, so we'll have to look elsewhere for improvements. This is usually the point at which most non-GPU programmers stop trying to optimize, but there's a lot left to check. I'm now going to explain the process of intermediate shader optimization. To make this more bearable to the average viewer, please enjoy even more clips of my cat. Shader performance problems can be categorized as one of three kinds of bottlenecks. You will often hear that texture sampling is expensive, but not all texture samples are created equal. The amount of memory we are requesting matters, and it matters way more than you think. Our pixel sorter is making n-squared texture samples of our most expensive texture, the Unity source buffer. The sheer amount of memory that's being requested is heavily taxing our GPU, something we refer to as a memory bandwidth bottleneck. Unfortunately, the number of samples are required for our algorithm, but we can reduce the size of the requested buffer in a major way. If we take a look at our sorting, we don't actually care about the color at all, just the value we sort by. We can create a new 8-bit buffer and pre-calculate our sorting value into it in another shader pass before the pixel sort occurs. If we do n squared samples of this buffer instead, we eliminate the duplicate work of converting the colors into sort values and we reduce the memory bandwidth by 87.5%. This optimization gave us a 50% speed increase, which would feel a lot better if it still wasn't so bad. Thankfully, we can still do more. I'm now going to explain the process of advanced shader optimization. Shader performance problems can be categorized as one of four kinds of bottlenecks. Compute shaders do work in groups. These groups consist of a number of threads, and we as the programmer control how many groups there are and how many threads are in each group. Our pixel sorter is dispatching one group of one thread for every single pixel of the texture, which normally would be an extremely terrible idea, but in this context, it's okay because 99.9% .9 of the groups are going to immediately drop out and not do any work at all. The reason I'm doing this is because compute shaders have a secret superpower that no other shader has called group shared memory, also referred to as local memory. When we sample a texture, we are requesting from global memory. Our pixel sorter is making n squared global memory requests of the same memory over and over again, which sounds like a problem. This is where local memory saves the day. We can preload all of that global memory into our group shared memory before we do the sort. That way, we do n squared requests of local memory instead. To visualize how this is faster, imagine you are moving from one house to another, but these houses are on opposite sides of the town. While you could drive back and forth between the houses to pick up one box at a time, it would be much faster to rent a big truck and put all of the boxes in that before driving it back over to the new house, making it much faster to obtain those boxes again. For us, the old house is global memory, and the big truck is the group shared memory. This optimization reduced our render time down to nearly 90% from our initial performance in the worst case. These are the kinds of performance increases that graphics programmers have wet dreams about but it would be a lot more impressive if it actually got us even remotely close to our performance target. Ultimately, the single-threaded sorting is just too slow, and due to the exponential nature of our algorithm, even mild increases in resolution will drastically decrease our performance. So ultimately, we only have one thing left to try when it comes to making the effect fast enough for real time. Now, I know what you're about to ask. Mr. Rolla, why do we care about the worst case so much? And that's a great question. I mentioned earlier that compute shaders do work in groups. A compute shader dispatch is not finished until all the groups complete their work. GPU algorithms are always designed such that work is equally divided across the groups, and they all finish at roughly the same time. But as I've demonstrated, it's not possible to optimally divide up the work of our pixel sorter. If we have two pixel sorting groups, one group group is sorting a span of 100 pixels, and another is sorting a span of 20 pixels, no matter what, we will have to wait for the first group to finish, and so our shader execution time is gatekept by the time it takes to sort the longest span in the mask. At this point, I've done everything I can to bring up the performance of those long spans, and so all we can do now is compromise on visual quality by putting a hard limit on span length. Setting the limit to something like 200 brings our absolute worst case performance to around 
around 8.5 milliseconds, which while not even close to our 2 millisecond ideal target, can still be considered good enough. The span length limit is very obvious though, so we can fix this by adding random offset intervals to the spans to reduce the uniformity. Our real-time pixel sorter is finished! Now we can do the fun art part. It's kind of hard to find images that work well with the pixel sorter, but when it looks good, it looks really good. Whether or not vertical sorting or horizontal sorting looks better is context dependent, and we can reverse the sorting order to get different visuals as well. Right now, I am sorting by luminance, but we can also sort by red, green, blue, saturation, or my personal favorite, hue. We can easily animate the effect by randomly offsetting the spans each frame, which ends up looking a little like a VHS effect. Then we can start mixing it with other effects. We can do some stylistic HDR color correction and tone map the result, increase the image detail with sharpness, apply the Kuohara filter to stylize, and then do our pixel sort. If we want to do something more glitchy, we swap to horizontal sorting, sort by hue, and then animate the offsets. We apply a dither to reduce the color palette, and then we can zoom in to accentuate the glitched pixels. Lastly, we apply some tasteful chromatic aberration but it's not very noticeable. Here's a few more examples I made. If you want to see more, be sure to check out my Twitter. Anyways, the reason I made this effect in the first place was to play a game with it, so let's switch over to Final Fantasy XIV. Upon first inspection, you can see that there's no way you could ever play a game with this effect on, but it sure does look cool. It's particularly great at making images very edgy, and so I tried to take that to the extreme with the following stylized render pipeline. First, we apply XEGTAO for better shadows, color correct and tone map, apply film grain, not for aesthetic appeal, but because it helps animate animate the pixel sort by modifying the pixels randomly. Then, we do our pixel sort, based on hue. I really like how dithering looks, so I used it again here with a very strict palette. Bloom softens the image and also makes the game look kind of foggy. Lastly, we do one final color correct and sharpen the output to accentuate the dither. The high contrast with fleshy reds and desaturated blues makes for an edgy color palette, and the pixel sort really sells the horror aesthetic, allowing for some crazy face renders. As usual, this shader is freely available to play around with in the description. In the end, the real-time pixel sorter is a bit of a failure. I truly believe that no efficient solution to this problem exists, even though it feels like there should be. But I think my solution is good enough for a video game photo mode, since you'd never use this effect for gameplay anyways. This has made an excellent case study for what GPUs aren't very good at, as well as how important memory optimizations are for the performance of your shaders. I hope you can apply this knowledge in your own endeavors. If you would like to have a say in what I do next, all of my patrons get to vote on the next video topic. If you'd like to see me work on water, or maybe do another post-processing effect, you all get to control the channel tech tree and how my videos evolve. As usual, a big thank you to all of my current patrons. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. I really did like those cat clips.